decision to go with the Jurchenjin uh, led to one disaster after another. They were not reliable allies. They invaded and they put the capital Kaifeng under siege. It was a two-month siege. Uh, rocks from Huizong's garden were used as ammunition in the catapults. And then after the city fell, after they uh, capitulated and said, okay, okay, uh, the Jurchens locked the city gates. You know, it's a city that's completely, a city is a chung, which means it has a wall with gates. And so they locked the people inside the city without resources. This is not the version that I last had, and that's too bad. But we'll just go with what we have here. Um, so people starved, bodies piled up. And meanwhile, the court was incentivized to uh, fulfill Jurchen um, ever-increasing demands for gold and silver by the Jurchen threat that they would turn their troops loose to rape and pillage. So the court let the freezing citizens into the northern Marchmont garden, this fabulous garden that Huizong had built, to dismantle the buildings for firewood. And the vast collections that Huizong had assembled were largely lost. Uh, it's very grim. Um, the Jurchen carried off thousands of carts of loot and imperial regalia, and they took prisoner. Chinese loved to keep records, so it says, 11,635 women, the retired emperor, Huizong, and the just deposed emperor, Qinzong, and their consorts, and several thousand others, including officials, attendants, eunuchs, craftsmen, and servants. And they were all taken far north, uh, where Beijing is today, and even further north, and most of the captives perished in the first couple of years either starvation or um, uh, freezing. And thousands of clansmen and ordinary people who managed to evade capture braved a dangerous journey south, pursued by church and troops all the way. And one of the huge ironies uh, is that they were actually forced south into what is what was um, uh, exile territory. So there's a phrase called crossing to the south. When you're first a student of Chinese and you read, oh, crossing, Nandu, okay, moving to the south. That encapsulates, that's a euphemism for this disastrous situation, the chaotic events that demarcate the northern Song from the southern Song. Uh, so the empire was hugely shrunk and the populace was now living in proximity to these exile destinations. I won't point out where Su Xu and Huang Tingjin were sent, but they, Su Xu was exiled four times, <laughs> and he was uh, tended to be outspoken. Um, so they made their capital the beautiful city of Hangzhou, and uh, it is a gentle climate, it is uh, built around the West Lake. If you've been to Hangzhou, you know it's incredibly beautiful with rolling hills around the West Lake. And uh, great temples that had already been there became larger and flourished and uh, there were rock-cut um, Buddhas in many of them and there were also tea plantations. Tea had already from the Han Dynasty, from the uh, early uh, first millennium been a, an occasional drink of the elite, but now it was spreading into the culture very widely. And uh, Hangzhou was a perfect place for raising tea plants. One of the huge clan centers, so there are thousands of imperial clan members who flee south, and one of the clan centers was at Jizhou in uh, Jiangxi province. And the kilns at Jizhou produced a range of black wares, 
black and brown glazed wares. And in the exhibition that's coming this summer from the Palace Museum Taipei, there will be a, a tea bowl that has leaves in it. Uh, So falling leaves uh, are a metaphor for people returning to their roots, but more often in poetry, they, it is uh, a metaphor for unworthy man, men being cast aside. That comes from the chutza, from annotations in the, uh, to the songs of the South. Um, so this image is of leaves being swept up by the wind and flying and scattering uncontrolled, which is actually more typical of what happens to leaves that fall. Um, so in the 12th century, when leaf bowls were uh, being made in Jijou, tea was, uh, especially the tea from fresh green, um, the tips of the new leaves in the spring, was ground into a powder. They're dried, ground into a powder, and then put in a bowl and whipped up with hot water. And so it has this wonderful frothy mix. So you can imagine, you take tea in a leaf bowl. Just imagine, you pick up the bowl, it's warm, you feel the warmth of it. You smell the grassy fragrance of the tea you appreciate the frothy greenness, you sip the tea, and then you see the leaves in the bottom. And so, for this population of uh, refugees for whom such metaphors were fitting, uh, this could be a meditation on those who were lost, those who were cast aside. These were the survivors who were drinking tea, and the, those who had managed to get to the south and were temporarily housed in Buddhist monasteries or in government buildings. So these Buddhist monasteries were holding tea ceremonies and um, it's very plausible that uh, these uh, refugees were silently meditating on those who were lost. Because of course in Chinese society there's a taboo against mentioning death. So this was a silent way to uh, commemorate those who were lost. Now, I apologize because the, these are not the slides that I finally put together, but we'll just look at them. Uh, one of the things that um, the Gaozong Emperor, who was not in the capital when it was sacked, he stayed away and then he was able to flee south with one Empress Dowager, who actually had some of the portraits from an ancestral temple that was outside the city. So they made their way south and they were able to reconstitute the court at Hangzhou and named Hangzhou the temporary capital because there was the expectation that they would move back. And so this painting was singularly appropriate. This is the Duke One of Jin uh, retaking his state, uh, recovering his state. This is a long hand scroll in the palace, in the <laughs> Metropolitan Museum in New York. <laughs> the um, scroll is beautifully painted with uh, the Duke coming along and he goes through all sorts of trials. It takes him 19 years to make his way back to his state and recover it. And he does it by being a really good person and being uh, trustworthy. And so this was a good uh, sign for, um, uh, for uh, Gaozong in the south. And then the, there were other paintings like this one in Tianjin that is the future Gaozong dreaming that uh, Qinzong, the uh, emperor who's now off in the north, hands him the robe. This is a series of uh, 10 auspicious omens for dynastic revival. And one of the first ones is uh, that when he's born, there's a great purple light in the, in the room where uh, his mother gives birth to him. There was also other history painting, like uh, the carriages uh, that brought 
uh, the Empress Dowager back to, uh, from the north to the south. This is one of the few times when uh, the uh, Jurchen Jin allowed uh, for uh, carriages for, uh, to travel to the southern Song. Now, it became a kind of um, a negative to serve in the imperial court. That was really a bad thing for the court. They wanted to recruit uh, able men. Uh, this little painting that is a little bit later, but it's uh, typical of the kinds of attitudes that were held at the time. This is originally from the great um, warring states book, the Zhuangzi, the story of uh, Xu Yo, who the um, uh, Emperor Yao, the sage Emperor Yao, wants to recruit for his government. Xu Yo is scandalized. He is offended at this request. And he goes to, in this case, a waterfall, and washes out his ears. And the <laughs> ox herder, Chao Fu, sees this happening and he pulls his ox away from the water, lest the ox drink the polluted water. <laughs> <laughs> so this kind of extreme and um, um, reaction to government service was uh, circulating in the Southern Song. And uh, scholars found many ways to uh, serve for a brief time and then withdraw or simply uh, to pursue other activities, to be a teacher, to be a, um, a, a writer for someone else, to be a ghost writer. So um, the government mounted several um, programs to uh, assure, reassure scholars that uh, they were listening, that they would not punish people who spoke out. And this is a famous Han Dynasty story of a uh, brave official who criticized the emperor and uh, for uh, employing a man who was considered corrupt and evil and devious. And uh, the guards at the court try to pull him away uh, and chain him to the balustrade. And he's so determined that he breaks the balustrade. And then ever after, a broken balustrade was a signal was a reminder to the emperor that he should listen to the worthy, he should accept contrarian advice. So that became a, uh, an aspect of um, palace architecture. Another painting that uh, re was intended to reassure, but also it could work the other way, that is it could be, we don't know who commissioned these paintings, so we don't know who the audience was, but it would work either way. The Confucian scholar should say, could say, Your Highness, it is our responsibility to advise you. You should listen to our advice. And so here we see um, uh, an official daring to criticize a concubine for sitting next to the official, which uh, next to the emperor, which I thought was amusing because, of course, it's the emperor who's smitten with her and who has allowed her, in fact, probably encouraged her sit, to sit next to him. Another um, now, Hui Tsung's collecting, his fanatic collecting, because he had thousands and thousands of paintings and bronzes and calligraphies, was partly blamed for the fall of the Northern Song. Of course, if it hadn't fallen, he probably would be championed as the great exemplar of all collectors. Later he was. But at this point, Gao Zong has to be very careful not to be too ostentatious in his collecting. So instead of having frivolous poems about banquets in his garden, he turns to the classical source of poetry, the canonical uh, book of odes, the Shi Jing, uh, for the uh, source of the painting and poetry that is produced at court. So he 
employs Mahajir, the a, a very modest, uh, low-level official, to paint for him, and he inscribes the poems, all 305. And the reason this is a canonical text is that it's said that Confucius himself had edited and chosen the 305 poems. So it's a, a book that everyone, it's one of the classics that everyone had to read and, and learn from. Um, Mahajir is credited with uh, having moved the uh, style of painting away from colorful uh, magic realism that was done at the Huizong court towards a more subdued literati style. And uh, that you can see in these uh, various paintings uh, of Mahajir, this being one in the Metropolitan Museum. And Mahajir's style is called an orchid leaf brushstroke style. And that it, of the paintings that survive today, attributed to Mahajir, perhaps half of them are later, because he's, he's pretty easy to imitate. Um, but his best paintings are very distinctive and entertaining and emphasize uh, brush stroke and uh, ink, ink work. Uh, here's one more example and another example. Now, in the um, uh, 12th century, another ex extraordinary woman rose to prominence. We heard in the first section about Empress Liu of the um, 11th century, who was consort to Junzong and the regent to Renzong. And then in the southern Song, there was a powerful woman uh, who was Gaozong's consort, chief consort, uh, Empress Wu, and she brought into the palace this lovely singing girl, very talented young singing girl. And all we know is that she's called Yang Meizi, and she's 11 or 12 when she comes into the palace. And uh, Yang Meizi's date of birth isn't even known, let alone who her family was. Uh, it was maybe 1162, maybe 1172. But the um, most definitive work on Yang Meizi is by Hui Shu Li, and it's on the uh, bibliography on your website. Now, she uh, manages against all expectations to rise through the ranks of, from singing girl of unknown origin eventually to Empress. So you can imagine she's a very smart and shrewd woman who outmaneuvers all of her rivals. And uh, she becomes uh, the Empress for um, Ningzong, who was not all that bright. And you wonder if the person who portrayed him didn't cultivate that side, I don't know. But anyway, um, Yang Meizi uh, uh, was brought, after Empress Wu dies, she is promoted to Jeyu, the f lady fair and handsome, and then she needs a pedigree, she needs background. So uh, there's a search for an elder brother, and eventually, um, a young Tsushan is found from Kwaiji, and uh, he agrees to be her elder brother. And uh, there, thereafter, he, of course, gets honors, and he becomes a member of the imperial family. His sons get honors, and then she uh, uh, is made uh, empress, and uh, actually has great influence in the um, um, administration as well as in the arts. And, and then her husband dies in uh, 24 and she uh, survives him for another uh, nine years. At this time, there is a marvelous painter named Ma Yuan who is uh, able to do the most astonishing one really wonderful imaginative paintings. 
this is one little fan in the Metropolitan Museum where a scholar sits on a bank and looks up at the moon. And you can see that uh, he is looking past the moon and what's harder to see is that he is in a garden. And you know that because there is here this little thatched uh, roof to probably a pavilion. Mayuan was one of her favorite painters and uh, this painting is coming uh, to the Asian Art Museum this summer in the exhibition from uh, the Palace Museum. It has uh, this wonderful scholar strolling along the mountain path. He's stroking his beard. He seems lost in thought. He's looking up, maybe at the birds, maybe he's composing a poem. And I like to think that the couplet up there is his thoughts manifested. That is, he's working on a couplet, and there it is. And it may be translated, brushing my sleeves, wildflowers dance of their own accord. Fleeing man, secluded birds interrupt their songs. So it's a, a very evocative painting, and it's typical of uh, the kind of painting that was being done in Hangzhou at this time with lots of mist, uh, lots of atmosphere, a sense of recession, great depth in the painting. And uh, you can see just a few steps behind him at the uh, lower right corner of the painting is a um, page who is carrying a guqin, a zither, uh, that scholars so loved. It's a, a stringed instrument, and you press down the strings and then uh, pluck them, press them down with the left hand, pluck them with the right hand, uh, lovely, soft, resonant tones. And uh, so the scholar may decide at some point to uh, pause and play his zither. Uh, one of the extraordinary paintings by Ma Yuan is a set of 12 views of water in the Palace Museum in Beijing. And each one has a four-character title, such as uh, these rolling waves of the Yellow River. So each one has, and the Changjiang, so the, the lapping waves on the Yangtze River. And then these soft waves. Remember who we saw? juxtaposed with water, Madame Liu, Empress Liu, and her, uh, well, the sage mother in the uh, Jinsa shrine has water ar all around her. And so it's not, uh, it's a very yin image, that is, in the yin-yang system, it is the feminine principle um, that is most associated um, closely associated with water. Another uh, image that uh, the Ma family had um, five generations of painters. And Ma Lin is the son of Ma Yuan. Ma Yuan being already, maybe he's the third, fourth generation. And uh, Ma Lin, who you see here, is the fifth generation. And uh, he probably painted this after uh, Yang Meiza transcribed her poem, because you wouldn't want to have a painting spoil if you made a mistake in your transcription of a poem. So chances are she finished her transcription, and then he had the responsibility of uh, painting something that would complement her poem. And um, her poem says, like a cold butterfly passing the night in the corolla, embracing the rouge center while recalling a past encounter. How lovely are the buds at the tip of the chilled branch. Such is the beauty that adorned the Han Palace. So we have here a very erotic, suggestive poem. Uh, Hui Shu Li likes to think that she's writing for her husband, Ning Tsung, 
It's not impossible that she's writing for the painter himself. We don't know for sure. There are different opinions on that. But the butterfly is an erotic image, and the plum blossom, um, although it's an image of regeneration, and therefore becomes very popular as an image during the, uh, the Southern Song, because they want regeneration. So it's not only the dynastic regeneration, it's the individual's regeneration. After a harsh winter, uh, the uh, plum blossom uh, symbolizes a return to um, vitality. So Empress Yang was an influential figure right up to her death, and this quatrain um, certainly um, suggests that although it adopts the trope of the neglected palace woman, it also is full of reminders of spring and vitality. Now, Li Zong was uh, the emperor that followed Ning Zong for almost 30 years. And uh, one of the fascinating things that uh, one of the scholars at the Palace Museum in Taipei has done is to analyze uh, Li Zong's face. Note how his eyes are extremely slanted. There's an emphasis on the slant. And these are called phoenix eyes. And it's said that Fu Xi, one of the sage emperors of great antiquity, had eyes that looked like a phoenix's eyes. And so we have here this interesting uh, correlation of portraits done at the time and also portraits of these sage em emperors. Sage Emperor Yu and the King Tong of the Shang Dynasty and King Wu of the Zhou. So it's, and then finally, this, oh, sorry, thought I had the pointer. This painting is what we have here, this face. And it too has this suggestion of phoenix eyes and therefore is a very uh, evocative possibility that this is a portrait of uh, Li Zong himself. He's listening to wind in the pines. And uh, this is possibly a Taoist image. It's often interpreted as listening to the music of nature, which is entirely possible. But it's also listening to what is being said by scholars. Because the pine tree is an image of um, a man who uh, will stay true to his principles through harsh uh, weather and um, circumstances. And this comes from the Analects, from Confucius himself, who said that it's only the pine tree that stays green when other trees change their colors. Uh, so that trope is picked up by a scholar in the Tang Dynasty. When, one of, when Han Yu's follower, uh, Meng Zhao, is sent to a very far southern post, distant southern post. He worries that he's being exiled to the south. And Han Yu said, uh, I'll wait and hear. He said, pine trees make no sound of their own accord, and water makes no sound of its own accord. It's when the wind whips up the trees, when water crashes down uh, slopes that it makes sound. I will wait and hear what your sound is. Will you sing out for the state, or will you be singing out, complaining about your own situation? So listening to Wind in the Pines from the Tang Dynasty also carries that nugget of meaning. Who, what, what, are, you, what are you saying? What are you complaining about? Or what are you um, celebrating in your uh, voicing of um, uh, sound? Well, the disastrous um, end of the Northern Song and Southern Song led people to 
even to today, to say that they like Song paintings, but they don't like the Song dynasty. It was militarily weak. I hear that all the time when I tell someone I'm studying Song painting. Um, but the the danger of indulging in wholesale collecting, like Emperor Huizong had done, uh, was certainly a lesson that many emperors took on. And admiration for Huizong scale collecting um, emerged only in the 18th century. Uh, and you'll hear about that when Pat Ebri speaks to you later at the end of the series. Um, the Chenlong Emperor endeavored to outdo Huizong in every category of collecting. Um, so that is um, something to look forward to in this series. So thank you very much, and I'm happy to take questions.